Ratchet is a clothing company from the UK started by a young man with a vision, a dream, and determination. They have various prints and styles for men, women, and children. I'll include a link to their website down below in the description for this video. All right, Brandon Witt, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. Great to be with you. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm doing good. How about y'all? I'm doing good. So you are the pastor at Alta First Baptist Church. That's correct. I know that you grew up on a farm. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, basically all of my family around me had farms as well. So a lot of tobacco farms back then, corn farms, you know, livestock, of course. Here in this area, there's a lot of peanuts and cotton, that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, grew up there um, where I was born and raised. I was the sixth generation to be born and raised in that part of Florida. Did you learn how to farm while you were growing up? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, growing up, probably since the age of 11 or 12, I started growing different crops. We would raise livestock, but I would grow crops for myself in the summer to sell produce, peas, corn, that sort of thing. You know, ultimately just to help out. Basically every summer, you know, in, in order to get the clothes that you want, to get the things you want, I would grow these crops and ultimately sell them and get my clothes that way. They would give you a little piece of land to uh, cultivate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, me and my grandpa would basically do this together. And um, usually we would, we would grow several hundred bushels of peas and corn and things of this nature. Yeah, great memories growing up there. But, but yeah, probably two to three acres we would set to the side and, and just grow for this. How many acres did your family have? Uh, it varied. It, it began with that farm. It began with 160. But in, yeah, but in time, um, as allotments were bought out and yeah. as my father was basically forced to sell part of it due to a power plant coming in, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's today right around 40 of the original left. Which is still a lot. Yeah, 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 de definitely, definitely. I know with the corn, if I'm and correct me if I'm wrong, to prevent the deers and animals from eating your good corn, they would plant like two, three rows of this other corn that is basically for feed. Is that true? There, it wasn't an issue. Um, oh. I, actually, the, the irony is where I grew up, deer just were not in, in that part of Florida or well, in, in that part of the county. Um, that they just weren't an issue. But but yes, that there's different stuff farmers would do. Ultimately, I, I don't believe there was one trick. They basically get nuisance tags and have to deal with them that way. Really? That particular area of the county never really had a deer issue whatsoever. Well, that's, that's good for you farmers. <laughs> Absolutely. So growing up, I know that you mentioned to me that church was a big part of your life. Absolutely. I remember even before my parents became Christians, they were always in church, but I would go with my grandparents. And probably when I was about 10, 11 years old, they become Christians, my mom and dad. And, and I was 12 whenever I, I accepted that myself. Um, so yes, I, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night was consistently raised in church. And this was the and, Baptist church? Yes. Well, my, my grandparents... Um, went to a Lutheran church. When they settled in Florida, the oldest Lutheran church in the state of Florida, my family was was one of the pioneers of that. Yeah, 1859, they started the church, Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Lake City. I, I grew up partially there for, for the first few years, but uh, Southern Baptist later, yes. I think I told you when I was down in Savannah, I had been invited to a Baptist church. So I grew up Catholic and I've never been to a Baptist church. So when I went, naturally I was surprised because they do their whole mass is conducted differently, right? At one point, I was the only one doing the sign of the cross uh -huh. out of the whole uh, congregation. <laughs> I was looking uh -huh. around and it was just me. <laughs> you know, the Catholics, we do a little different. Right, right. Uh, yeah, absolutely. But it's a very uplifting service, that I can tell you. Yeah. 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 And, and, and when I was, I know it's not the same, but when I was in Charleston, Part of my family, when they come over, they they were a part of of the Huguenot church there. And so when they take communion it or um, the Lord's Supper, it, it's vastly different than how a Baptist would, you know. So I totally get that. 
So there came a point you become a welder. Then you actually started working as a welder. Yeah, and at the point uh, of of my injury, I was working at a mine and uh, phosphate mine, and and I was in the process of taking tests and certifications and and things of that nature for that plant. Now I was already a, a certified welder. And there came a day I know that unfortunately you were welding under a train, and then there was an accident. Yeah, that uh, that evening it was March the third, around midnight. Um, 2004, I was working up underneath the tanker and uh, actually uh, working on the valve at the time. And uh, that's when that accident happened. Me and a friend of mine were along a stationary track. There were six empty tankers and we were basically closing them up. We, we had went through and checked them and cleaned them and, and, and all of that stuff. And uh, about midnight that night, a train bringing in more tankers um, was coming down the tracks. And, and of course, in order to get the picture and to understand, we have our own train in the plant, but you've also got CSX or one of the railroad lines that are constantly running in and out. And so next to our stationary track is about 40 holding tracks. And so I don't know how many cars they could hold. I would probably guess four to 500, you know, total. So trains are, are coming by us all the time. Don't think anything of it. And the train, as they were coming down the track that night, instead of making the left turn like they were supposed to, they ran into us. And I was underneath that first tanker. And so the valve handle is probably about that, well, probably longer than that, okay. that you would open and close the bottom of the tanker with. And so when I realized that it had hit, I tried to run out from underneath the tanker. I was kind of in a squatted position at the time. And when I did, the valve handle hit me in the back and immediately knocked me down into some sulfuric acid. I, I remember it, it knocked me to where I was kind of laying over the tracks and everything's still moving. I remember seeing that big steel wheel rolling towards me and I went to kick my feet to move. They didn't move. So I knew immediately that I had some sort of spinal injury. Mm -hmm. So I grabbed my legs and threw them over the tracks. And, and of course, help got there. My, my friend was able to get out because he was at the end of the line. And so eventually they got to me that night and got me to the hospital. You ultimately had a broken back. Yeah, I, I broke my L3 and L4 vertebrae. After about 20 minutes, I started regaining the, the sensation in my legs. I was taken to a hospital in Jacksonville. I went through surgery and uh, was there for about two weeks. Basically had a spinal fusion for, for those who are familiar with that put titanium, basically put a, built a ladder around my lower spine. I went from there to a rehabilitation place in Gainesville for about six weeks, um, as far as living there and uh, learning to walk again, learning to, to function again, so to speak. That continued, after I got out of there, I continued with therapy basically four to five times a week. I would drive there for about two years. That began in 2004, that March of, of 04. So, yeah, that's a long time for uh, rehabilitation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that injury took you out, obviously, for, for at least two years. Yeah, yeah, Mar March 3rd of 04. Tell you the way God worked in this thing. I never grew up around a pastor, or a preacher, so to speak. Um, my parents were kind of learning as I was learning. So, so there wasn't that mentor, so to speak, at that point in time. But I, I always sensed in my spirit from an early age after my conversion, I just had a draw to the Bible. I, I would watch my grandmother read it every day, and uh, and and it rubbed off on me. And 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 I remember uh, writing to the Billy Graham organization because they had an advertisement that that spoke of you can write us, we'll send you a free Bible. Mm -hmm. And and I remember writing. I still got the Bible here in my office, and and I would just get up in the mornings and and read, and and I always had this draw to God ultimately a draw to his word. And so I, I felt a heavy calling upon my life. I just didn't know what to make of it. And as time rocked on, I never really got out in the world, but like a lot of people, I began to live for me in the sense I, I ultimately began to chase the money. And that's what I was doing. And so that accident, as I look back at it, um, was God's way of getting my attention and getting me back on the right path. And, and there's a Bible verse that uh, sticks out to me, 2 Corinthians 7.10. It says, godly sorrow, which means sorrow ultimately that God allows or orchestrates, 
produces repentance that leads to salvation, not to be regretted. Um, I, I look at this accident as not something God did to me, but something God did for me. He, he had to get my attention and, uh, and ultimately set me on the path that I'm on today. And I know that meeting a Vietnam vet helped you get there in his injury. He had lost two legs. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Tim Lee, he, going back to Vietnam, he, he was the son of a pastor. Very similar in the sense that, that he felt like he was running from God's call, stepped on a landmine there in, in Vietnam. And I remember when he was sharing with us at our church, made the statement that I just made, and that's where I got it from. God didn't do this to me. God did this for me and ultimately set his life on, on the path that, that God had for him. And, and that's exactly the way I would view my, my accident. Which a lot of times in life, misfortune comes into our lives. Some of us could blame God and say, why are you doing this to me? That happens with a lot of people. Blessings come in the form of misfortune, you know, or, or disguised by misfortune. Things in this life happen for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. We, we may not understand it at the time, but in time, we could look back on it and say, I'm glad that that happened, right? Even something terrible that took place. You're glad Absolutely. that it took place because you wouldn't be where you are in life presently. 100%. You, you know, a verse that, that stands out to me is Romans 8, 28. It says that all things work together for good to those who love God, who's been called according to his purpose. And I think of the story of Joseph, you know, whose brother sold him into slavery, ultimately broke his, his trust falsely accused, ends up in prison. But, you know, as the end of Genesis unfolds and we find out that story, um, God was behind all of this in the sense that he was getting Joseph the way he wanted him to because a famine hit the land. And so when his brothers discover um, that their brother that they thought that they had sold off into slavery and who was dead just to get rid of was alive and was the second most powerful person in Egypt, they were deathly afraid. And of course, Joseph's statement to them there in Genesis chapter 50 is what you meant for evil, God used for good. And so all of this adversity that we face, God uses it for our good. And, and I think one of the biggest lessons that God needed to teach me and needs to teach us in general is to trust him. Trust him even when it doesn't make sense, because as we progress forward, we will look back and say, thank God that happened to me. Yeah. I will. I wouldn't have changed anything because it, it got me to this place. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. At some point, you decide to go to theology school. Yeah, absolutely. So in 2004 is my accident. 2006, I, I reach what they call maximum medical improvement. And from 2006 to the start, February of 07, uh, me and the insurance company are working on a settlement. And uh, once we and once we reached that settlement, I basically began an internship at the church I was going to, and I started taking my classes, my theological classes through Liberty University. And that began in 2007, and I graduated in 2011. But in the meantime, um, I, you know, I began an internship there at the church, and I was there for about two and a half years before I became a pastor myself. I think you first started being a pastor at 2010. Right, right. Technically, the end of 09, beginning of 10. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And how did that feel? You know, the first time getting up there, you know, okay. you're, putting, you're putting your education now into words and presenting it to a congregation. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you the, a, a funny story. So while I'm doing my internship, we have a, a Spanish ministry for migrant workers and we would do it on Sunday nights. Well, their kids speak English. And so, I, you know, I'm not bilingual, so I don't speak Spanish, but they needed somebody to, to teach their kids. So I remember the very first time I ever go to teach, I've got like 10 or 12 small kids. I'm a nervous wreck. Can't believe God's asked me to, you know, has led me to do this. And I remember I had like probably 30 minutes worth of stuff I'm going to share with these kids. I'm sweating bullets. I'm going back and forth to the water fountain, just, just basically <laughs> in my mind. And so finally do it. I finished in like 10 minutes. We go play for like 50. But, but I, you know, I remember that very vividly the, the very first time I taught. The irony is 
um, as I grew in that and I began to preach, ultimately the first church I, I ever preached that always had this, this weird comfort about it. And, and, and I know it was ultimately God and the first church I ever pastored, uh, my elementary PE teacher was there. I remember her telling me, I am so surprised that you ended up here. You were the shyest kid growing up, couldn't get a word out of you, you know, but would never public speak. But, but that's a testament to God. You know, everything we're not, he is. And, and God got me to, to that place. But yeah, always definitely a, a nervous energy as you begin something new. But once I got up there, it, it just, just, just felt natural. I think that in life, sometimes we think, especially when we're young, we think that we know what's right for us, right? And we're, we're on a path. And if we're on the wrong path, something happens in life to take us off that path. And like I mentioned, a lot of times it's in the form of misfortune. At that moment, you're saying to yourself, oh my God, what's going on in my life, right? What happened to my life? At that point, it's God moving you on the right path taking you off the path that you're on and moving you on the path that you belong on. And that's what I think happens to a lot of us. I know I could speak from experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and, and I 100% agree. I believe, and one of the mentors that, that kind of came alongside of me after I entered into the ministry uh, made a statement to me one time. And, and he said, if you really want the will of God for your life, he will never let you miss it. And, and I absolutely believe that. I, you know, I believe just what you were saying. Sometimes we're way out in the world, but through God's providence and his love for you and love for us, he draws us back in. And as he draws us back in and we begin to follow, you know, I know, especially early on, I'm trying to figure out, God, what do you want from me? God, you know, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? And his words always brought a, a lot of comfort to me in the sense that, that God never let me miss it. You know, sometimes you run ahead of God out of good intentions. You know, I, I think of the story of Moses. You know, did, was God going to free the Israelites from Egypt? Absolutely. Moses wanted the same thing. But Moses was 40 years ahead of God. And he wound up killing somebody. And um, and so he, he goes off. And when the time's right, God brings him back. So Moses wanted what God wanted in that sense. Timing just wasn't there. And oftentimes out of good intentions, that's where we are. Life is very strange, you know, and life has many bumps in the roads, but there comes a point in time where, like I mentioned, you'll be on the right path and you'll know you're on the right path and life will change. And how I know this is the way I used to live my life was all through negativity. I was surrounded by negativity. I was living life as a criminal and nothing good was taking place and nothing good came out of it. But when the shift came and I was now on a different path, life is more peaceful now. Life is more positive. Good things are happening. And that's that's a testament to I'm on the right path. Absolutely. And 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 there's there's no amount of power or wealth that can buy peace. And 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 peace is just one of those things mm -hmm. that we absolutely need. And ultimately, it's going to only come from getting our lives right with God, being in alignment with him, with his plans. There, there, there's so many people I've met through the years who, and, and, and I know we all see it on social media. If you were to look at their lives through social media or from a distance, everything looks right. Everything looks great, but there's no peace there. You know, and, and, and that's a habit that I think many of us fall into. We, we end up chasing the wrong things, but I think that's a lesson we need to all kind of learn the hard way, uh, uh, saying that I don't even know where it comes from, but always stuck with me. Lessons not learned in blood are soon forgotten. And there's a lot of truth to that. Hard times create people who get their priorities in line. And, and that's exactly what it was with me. When, when you're laying flat on your back and, and you don't know what's coming down the road, you, you know, I'm married. I, I have a, just find out, I, I think I shared with you about a week after my accident, my wife's pregnant with our yep. first son. What am I going to do? Am I going to ever be able to walk again? Am I going to ever be able to function again? All of these worries and thoughts are rolling through my mind um, but because going back to my childhood, which I, I certainly believe God orchestrated it, you know, I learned the value of what it meant to work and to go out and earn your keep, so to speak. And, um, and, and so those were lessons built into my mind early on. And, and all of a sudden, I feel helpless. All of a sudden, I can't do anything. 
And so it was ultimately through that period of time that, that I really seen the faithfulness of God. And, and my mind goes back to the story of Elijah in the Bible. Here, here's this brash, very bold, independent individual. You get to, I believe, at the beginning of 1 Kings 17. He runs into the presence of the king there and announces God's judgment on him. Isn't scared, isn't fearful. First thing God tells him to do is go run and hide. Absolutely killed his pride, right? Go hide by the brook chair. I'll send ravens to you to ultimately feed you. Now this strong independent man had to learn what it meant to depend upon God. And those were lessons I, I believe that were foundational in Elijah's life that carried him through. And, and same true for, for, for many of us as we grow. You mentioned chasing money. And a lot of people chase money because they believe that money brings them happiness. And it, that couldn't be anything less further than the truth. Absolutely. And, you know, that was the thing for me, the opportunity to work where I work and to be able to, to basically work all the hours I wanted to accumulate all the money I could possibly get my hands on. Again, it, it wasn't um, that I was out in the world, per se, in, in, a, in a very negative way. Life was just about me. It, it was about me getting what I could while I could. Um, and believing to some degree that, that that was success, believing to some degree that uh, that, that was going to bring me satisfaction. And, and of course, it didn't. That dream is ultimately what laid me on my back. And, and I'm thankful it did. My grandmother had a friend who was a priest and his name was Father Botley. He has since passed. And he had come to visit me. I was incarcerated. And he was telling me a story that when he first came out of the seminary, they sent him to Africa, and that's where he was stationed. He said they were very poor. Nobody had anything. There was a lot of death because the kids were dying. The young kids were dying, starving. They were cooking literally in the ground, a lot of people. And he said that once a month, he would have maybe one or two people from the village come to talk to him and just complain about life and, and vent to him how bad it was. He spent many years there, and then they ultimately took him and brought him back to the United States and put him in Staten Island in New York, and they put him in a parish there. And he said that he would look outside on a Sunday and see Mercedes and BMWs and beautiful cars and people coming with beautiful clothing and jewelry and whatnot. He said that not once a month, but on a weekly basis, sometimes even on a daily basis, there'd be over a dozen people coming to him to complain about how hard life is. Mm -hmm. And he would think while they were talking to him about the poor people in Africa. And it just goes to show you that once again, money does not buy happiness. And that's the mistake that a lot of people make because they chase money, believing that it's going to bring them ultimate happiness. And it doesn't. Absolutely. Uh, I believe I'd have to go back and look, but I believe it was 2019. It was it was pre-COVID. I went to Havana and I was down there for, I don't know, six or seven days in that area working with some churches. It was definitely eye opening. So I get exactly where he's coming from. You know, you're you're talking about a people who the highest levels of, of society there and, and for them, that would be police officers because they're the ones loyal to to those in power. We're making a hundred dollars a month. Yep. Uh, the, the guy I was with, whose whose wife was a dentist there, and if I remember right, she made ninety, maybe a hundred dollars a month. She mm -hmm. would do a lot of different side work, you know, kind of in that underground economy to help the family get ahead. But people in our country and people a lot of times in the West don't really understand what poverty is, and and so I think you you made a perfect point there believing that, that the American dream, quote unquote, or wealth is going to deliver you happiness when in fact it's not, because I, I see the same thing, you know, see these people, you know, hypothetically walking down the road with a big Virginia ham underneath their arm and complaining they ain't got nothing to eat. They mm -hmm. don't understand. The Italians say they cry with loaves of bread under their arm. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Some of the Cubans have one dress shirt, maybe one pair of slacks or jeans, a pair of sneakers, a pair of shoes. They don't have anything. Absolutely not. You know, in that setting, I, I would remember going through Havana, the different parts of it. And, and I went out into the countryside, too. What I was doing there, I was there because the Florida Baptists have a seminary there. A lot of people don't know this. This thing has been there for over 100 years, and they have operated and, and are, are still doing work even under that regime. And that regime, for the first time, is allowing 
us and others to go into Cuba and help them rebuild their churches. So that's what I was doing there as a part of a group from here, uh, meeting with, with their leadership down there. I believe it was called the, the West Cuban Baptist Association or something along those lines. But as you're going around, you're absolutely right. You see these, these little grocery outlets There'd be a line uh, basically around that people are waiting on their government handouts. Um, they can't really go and buy on their own. I, I mean, they can buy some stuff, but if you're making 60 bucks a month, you're not going to go buy very much at all. And so they would wait for their allotment of rice, um, for their allotment of coffee, allotment of chicken, very minuscule. But yes, um, certainly didn't have much, you know, at all. Definitely a wake up call. Definitely a wake up call. I think a lot of people think that they have it bad. The old saying, when you think you have it bad, somebody else has a lot worse. Absolutely. And I remember getting off the plane there. And as we got picked up, the police, um, military police outside there, there was a prison jail pretty close to the airport. Not quite sure where it was, but they had the prisoners lined up there and they had the dogs nipping at them biting at them. And from what I was told, it's kind of a welcome to those coming in. Okay, if you get out of line, here's what's going to happen. Just just another form of, of government intimidation at that well, point in time. And right. so living under that constant fear, living under that constant poverty, living under, you know, you may be asleep tonight and somebody come take you, put you in prison for some reason without any trial. Your family doesn't know where you are. Um, those are real problems. Yeah. And compared ultimately to, to, to where we are. But the good news is, even in the midst of that, there are people there, leadership people, Christian people, who could get out if they wanted to, but they refuse to leave. They are there with a, with a joy and with a peace that so many you know, in our country don't have and don't understand because they're in line with God and they're there really serving and pouring their lives out into to these other people. And they found uh, God's purpose for their life. And, and it's a beautiful thing to see. Great majority of them's been in prison. Maybe their, their father was executed or the father was in prison for the rest of their life, but they keep going. That there's, there, there's God at work in the midst of them that just propels them forward. Life wasn't easy for them with the Castro regime. Absolutely. So where do you see yourself in the next five years? The way it breaks down for me, basically on a weekly basis, I, I speak or I preach three times a week. And, and then I have a couple of classes throughout the week I teach as well. And then I'm also the moderator of our Baptist Association. So there's there's 12 churches here in, in this county and in the next that, that we form an association. And so I help facilitate that as well. Honestly, just trying to, to follow God's commission, God's purpose and plan for my life, wherever that takes me, whatever that looks like, but definitely um, sharing the hope of Christ with, with people and, and sharing his word and just trying to be an encouragement to them to, to ultimately let them know that no matter what they're facing, no matter what they're up against, that, that there's hope. You've got to step out in faith and trust Christ. And, and there's one thing that I would say to anyone listening, God will never disappoint you. Now, you may be disappointed in yourself or in your life, but God is never going to disappoint you. He's never going to let you down. And as you hold on to that reality and truth, it changes your perception because either life is about us or life is about him. There's a quote I'll paraphrase that, that really struck at my heart, so to speak. And the quote paraphrasing was this, we have a misconception of what evil is. Evil in actuality is not you following Satan or going out doing these horrible things. Evil is you shifting your focus from God to yourself. And the example that's given in, in that quote is how did Satan attack Eve? Satan attacked Eve by simply convincing her to put her eyes upon herself and take them off of God. And it's just that small of, of a cut that we make that changes everything. Now life becomes about me yeah. and, and lose my purpose with God. And as we put our eyes back upon God, everything falls back into place. Probably my, my favorite verse growing up through that period of time was Colossians 3, 2. And it says, set your mind on things above, not on the things of this earth. And when we put our minds and keep our minds upon God, the Bible promises that he'll keep you in peace. And, and of course, that's what we're after. We're after peace and we're after purpose at the end of the day. For me, I have only found that in the person of Christ. I think you're doing what you were meant to do. I appreciate that. I do. And I appreciate your time. And I know that you have a schedule and you're busy in your day. 
and I appreciate you taking the time to come on and, and talk with me. Absolutely. I'm honored. Absolutely. All right, Brandon. I, it was a pleasure having you. I hope you enjoyed the video. You could use the like button if you want. I thank everyone who has subscribed. If you haven't, you can do that as well. Okay, until the next time, take care and see you here.